from surgery, whether they're dealing with COVID. Uh, and I pray that you'd be with every one of these hands that were raised, these unmentioned. God, I thank you for the opportunity to pray, to be able to come before you into your throne room and share these prayer requests with you, knowing that you know what's best and you know exactly how to act on their behalf. I pray, God, that you would touch not only these prayer requests, but touch the choirs they sing tonight. Help us as we open up the Word of God again. Be with Jacob in the back with the teenagers. Be with the Awanas group, little boys and girls back there that are learning Bible verses and they're hearing the Word of God. I pray that everything that's done on this church campus will bring glory and honor to you. And tonight, may we really, tonight, worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray these things and we ask them all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen and amen. Come on, choir, sing for us.
aren't you thankful for the peace that passeth all understanding? Stand again with us tonight while the choir comes down. I want you to sing this hymn with us. I love this. Come on, let's sing together, church. Just over in the glory land I'll join the happy angel band. Just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land. There with the mighty host I'll stand. Just over in the glory Saints abide just over in the glory land, and I long to be by my Savior's side just over in the glory. Everybody, raise your voice just over in the glory land. I'll join the happy angel band just over in the glory. Just over in the glory land I am on my way to those mansions fair Just over in the glory land There to sing God's praise and His glory share Just over in the glory land Just over in the glory land church. Good singing tonight. I appreciate you. You can be seated. Appreciate you standing and singing with us. Great number for a Wednesday night. Thank you for being here. I want to ask the ushers to come across the front and we're going to receive the Wednesday night offering. Our Wednesday night offering goes into a benevolence fund. It helps people in our church that go through financial emergencies, difficulties that come up. This list of folks that are uh, having surgeries, some uh, when they miss work, they don't get paid when they're out of work or something like that. We try to step in and help them during that time. We've helped uh, uh, our elderly with uh, medication. We'll always take care of our widows, as the Bible teaches us to, fatherless. So uh, this is kind of what this offering goes to, and we have policies that kind of keep us from being taken advantage of. So everything that you give tonight, it's a blessing knowing that it goes back into the hands of fellow Christians and fellow laborers for Christ here at your church. And I appreciate you giving uh, to this offering tonight. The girls are going to sing for us while we receive the offering. Let's pray. Ask God's blessings on the offering before they sing. Father, thank you for this offering tonight. Give us wisdom as we make decisions over these things. And in those hands that receive it, may they give you glory and honor. Seeing it as you fulfilling the scripture that you, that you wrote, that you told us, that you would supply our every need, that you would take care of us. And God, I pray that you would give us wisdom as we make decisions over these things. The hands that receive it give you glory. Be with the girls as they sing for us. Help us as we open the word of God. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, girls. Sing for us. Even when the sky is falling, even when the rain is pouring, just know he's always there. storm is rolling he's always in control the storm does not control us the wind don't control the universe it's always in his hands so don't worry about tomorrow or any of your sorrows don't forget that he is in control might be crumbling the tears might be falling he's always in control 
Your heart might be broken Feeling pulled in each direction Don't worry, don't worry cause The storm does not control us The wind don't control the universe It's always in His hands so don't worry about tomorrow or any of your sorrows. Don't forget that he is in control. Because his love is bigger than all of your problems. Don't forget who's in control. Because his love is bigger than all of your problems don't forget who's in control the storm does not control us the wind don't control the universe it's always in his hands so don't worry about tomorrow or any of your sorrows don't forget don't forget that he is in control amen girls that's one that they wrote and I appreciate them singing that for us tonight I, I love the talent that God's given us in our young people and I always want to encourage them. If they want to sing, I want them to sing. I want them to be a blessing to you and be a blessing to me. Philippians chapter 3. We'll try our best to get out of Philippians chapter 3 tonight and then uh, leave the rest of the chapter or the end of the book until sometime later. But uh, I don't ever want to bog down in a place we shouldn't be bogged down. And, and when you go to study a book in the Bible, it really is a study of the entire Bible. Because every one of the verses that Paul writes links to other verses that he has written. And then... It all relates, of course, to Jesus Christ, who is the ultimate subject of the Bible. But we left the thought that he had, he had left us in chapter 3. Chapter 2 is talking about the joy that comes through our humility, the joy that comes the exaltation of Jesus Christ, the joy that comes in knowing people that are serving the Lord with us. Chapter 3, Paul, his theme verse for this chapter is, chapter, is verse 14. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God. What is that? prize? What is Paul pressing for? That pressing, that uh, intention of God, the reason that he has apprehended us is to make us like Christ. And Paul says, is indicating to the Christians at this church, he said, I have to, as the preacher, I have to, as the pastor, I have to, as the writer, as Paul, he said, I have to force myself to press toward that mark. I'm not perfect, but I want you to know that you have to press toward that Christ likeness. So how do we do that? In the end of the chapter, we're going to read how Paul tells us how to do that. How do we do that? How do we, how do we as Christians become like Christ, learn what it's like to be Christ-like? Well, you're holding in your hand the answer to that. The Bible, that's how you learn how to be Christ-like. The Old Testament was written and gives us a, uh, examples, and it sets the scene for him. All the Old Testament is written to bring him into remembrance that he's coming, that uh, the Messiah is on his way, and it creates the need for him. The Old Testament gives us the law, a law that cannot save us and a law that pronounces us dead and that death is coming because of our sin. But the New Testament starts with the Gospels, the announcement, He's here, He's come, the Savior has arrived. Acts tells us about the impact of that arrival and what it did to the first century world. The epistles delineate and tell us of the significance of his life and his ministry, what it means to us that he came. And now that we're Christians and believed in him, how we can follow him and follow others that are Christ-like, that we can press toward the mark of the prize, that the prize of being Christ-like, we can become more and more like him. We can uh, allow the Holy Spirit to lead us in being like him. And the New Testament finally concludes, and the revelation and consummation of his second coming the fact that Jesus is coming again and Paul leads us into that at the end of chapter 3 we study what it is like to be Christ-like we take our Bibles in and we learn what it's like to be Christ-like what it what it is like to be a Christ-like husband I didn't understand that until I got married 
what it's like to be a Christ-like parent. I didn't understand that until I had children. But there were things I understood about God that I could not understand any other way. I didn't know what it was like to be Christ-like as a shepherd or a, uh, an under-shepherd of people till I became a leader of people in the church, a Sunday school teacher, youth director, as a pastor. So I'm beginning to learn things about Christ. You're learning things about Christ-like, what, it's, what it is like to be Christ-like. Now listen to me very carefully. We can start to study the Bible for the sake of theology, but that's not the intent of your studying the Bible. We can start to study the Bible for the sake of answering other people's questions, but that's not why you study your Bible. We can even start to study the Bible, and many do, just for sake of argument, so they can win the argument. There are those that study the Bible so they can win points of debate, but that is not the purpose of studying your Bible. Studying your Bible, the intent of God is to save you through Christ, and then after that, to begin you, uh, begin you in a relationship where you become Christ-like until that day that you are made perfect. And what he has done, that good work in chapter 1, he said that he will perform in you till one day we have a glorified body and we're just like Christ, not only spiritually, but we're just like Christ, uh, we're just like Christ physically. And we become in his, we come in his presence. And I want to say, truth of studying your Bible, the truth that you study your Bible is to be more Christ-like. Don't study your Bible to win the argument. Don't study your Bible just to learn theology. It's important to know those things or to answer questions. But study your Bible to be Christ-like. And as you study your Bible and you become more Christ-like, you'll find yourself being more salt and light than heat in this world. This is one of the things about you learning to be Christ-like. For any other reason... If you're studying your Bible for any other reason, you're missing the whole point of the reason God saved you. Paul said, use that word, that I may apprehend that which I've been apprehended. God saved me to be Christ-like. So Paul said, I'm trying to learn to be Christ-like. If you're studying your Bible for any other reason, you're missing the whole point. God wants you to study your Bible so you can learn to be like Christ. And then secondly, the Holy Spirit is the one that's changing us into His image. My submission to the Holy Spirit is what transforms me into being Christ-like. Without Him, I cannot learn what it is. But with Him, I can learn all truth. And then He will speak. Jesus said that He will speak of Him. And He'll teach me how to be like Christ and what, how to want to be like Christ. There's more today that are studying their Bible for argument's sake and debate's sake than they are trying to be Christ-like. You're missing the point. You're missing the whole... You're not making... You're not making You're not getting near the prize. You're not even close to the prize until you start to become Christ-like. Now, I want to say this about Christ. In studying Christ and being Christ-like, this is what I have found. Christ is not unkind. There are many Christians that are unkind. Christ is not unkind. Christ is not complaining. Never once do you see in the Bible Jesus complaining about the situation he was in. There are a lot of Christians that complain. Critical. That's not being Christ-like, being unkind, being being ungracious. Jesus was graceful. He gave people grace. He was graceful. So I just want to let you know, I just want to clarify, there are a lot of Christians in this world that are not being Christ-like. You be Christ-like. That's the prize. That's what Paul said he's striving for. In this hall, under the theme of joy, there's nothing more joyful for a Christian than to pillow your head at night knowing that you're becoming more like Christ. That you are changing and fixing the things that don't look like him. But at the same time, you're changing and fixing the things that you want to be more like him. So Paul says in verse number 17, Brethren, be followers together of me. And mark them which walk so as you have us for in samples. Paul comes down to the practicality of all that he has written so far. He's in a Roman prison, chained to a Roman guard. 24 hours a day, his circumstances are not good. They have sent Epaphroditus to him to minister to him, and Epaphroditus became sick while he was there. Paul is sending him back with this letter, letting them know, now I want you to follow my example. Paul, are are you perfect? No, Paul has told them I'm not perfect. In fact, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, he says uh, that God gave me a thorn in the flesh, 
a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Why? Lest I be exalted above measure. Paul said, I'm not perfect. It erases that doctrine of perfection. You don't get saved and then become perfect. You're not perfect until we're with Christ. But we're striving to be Christ-like. Paul said, I'm not perfect. At the end of the book of Acts, Paul was rebuked by the apostles because of the way that he spoke to the high priest. And he said things he never should have said to that high priest. And the apostles came and corrected him. And Paul said, I have learned. I am trying to, there are some things that I have attained. That's what he said there in uh, the verses before this that I have, uh, uh, verse 16, that I have attained. I'm trying to apprehend this thing of being Christ-like. So Paul is telling them, I am not perfect, but I am trying. So as I try to be perfect, follow me. Follow me. I want to tell you this, when it comes to a man that's climbing a mountain, I don't need somebody that's at the top just yelling at me instructions and orders. I need somebody that's on the path I'm going on, roped to me, (laughs) giving me commands and instructions to say, when you got where you are, this is what I did to get where I am. That's Jesus. I'm tethered to Jesus. I am sealed by the Holy Spirit. We are yoked together. He's walking before me. I just don't need somebody like Paul up on his high horse yelling down at me saying, just do this. You'll make it through. No, Paul instead is saying, follow me. I've been the way that you've been. I'm on this path together. We're walking together. And that's what you need in life is leadership in your church and leadership in your Christian life. People that are examples. Paul is not in pride saying this. In fact, you can see his humility when he says in others. He said, not just me, not just follow me but he said others there are others I know in your church that are in samples to you there are those that are examples of Christianity he said follow follow them when it comes to us he uses that phrase be followers together of me this is what that means it literally means be fellow be fellow now I can't read the word what is it when you, when you uh, talk just like someone else? Imitate. <laughs> Fellow imitators. I don't know why. Just a senior moment there. Fellow imitators. He said this in Corinthians. He said this in Thessalonians. He told them. He said, be like me. Follow Christ as I am following Christ. Now, I appreciate that a lot more than somebody that's telling me how wrong I am and telling me how I need to get right. I like somebody that's showing me along the way. That's what Paul is saying. Follow your examples. There are those that have gone on before you, and they're examples. Paul is one. He said, there are others in your church. And I want to say this. This junk that's going on in social media, these men that are arguing, with one another and talking about one another that is not Christ-like when you see that realize it identify it this is not an example of a man I need to follow this is not Christ-like this is not what Christ would do I'm going somewhere with this but the Bible says you're to be Christ-like you're to be biblical you're to be mature and these immature unbiblical arguments that are going on in social media make the church Christianity and Christ look bad we are not going to get along with everybody here we're not all going to cross our T's the same or dot our I's the same but we are following the same Jesus we're going to the same heaven washed in the same blood the best thing you can do is do your job at following and being like Christ and leading others like Christ and the way somebody else do it keep your mouth closed you don't know them or the intent of their heart leave them alone stay off of Facebook and social media talking about them amen and amen I just had to get that out of my system. And there was some Holy Spirit in there, I can tell you that. Where are they then? Where are these leaders that we're looking for? I want to say in some places you can't find it in spiritual leadership today. No. When we get to the enemies in just a moment, I'll give you some examples. But you should be able to see this. There are men that you watch, there are men that you listen to preach that you should see. And the men I, I try to put in this pulpit, I promise you, I've watched their lives. And I think as, as best as I know, they're walking like Christ. We've had some, I've not had any, but Teague had some that fooled him. And it turned out that we're not walking like Christ and it all come out. 
But I'm saying when I put them in the pulpit, I believe they're walking like Christ. I believe that they're an example that you can follow. I wouldn't have them up here. I do that with the choir. I do that with our singers. I do that with our staff. If they're not walking with Christ, they're not getting up here. I'm not using them as an example. Our deacons, our teachers, all of them, I believe, ought to be following Christ and be able to say, follow me as I follow Christ. I'm not going to get it right all the time. Just like Paul, i got to say, I'm not perfect, but I'm trying. So if you just come along, we'll try together. What we get wrong, Jesus will straighten out. What we'll get right, we'll rejoice in, and the Holy Spirit can pat us on the back. Amen. That's good preaching. Listen, I went back two weeks ago to listen to the last sermon I preached from Philippians. And I just got to tell you, I I was a little excited about how good I preached that time. If you don't enjoy your own preaching, you ought not get up here. Amen. Where are they? Where are these leaders that the Bible's talking about? With the blurred Bible interpretations that we have? The skewed ministry of the Holy Spirit that's in this world today. The, I mean, it's messed up. The whole thing in the whole ministry of the Holy Spirit is messed up in most churches. The spiritual leadership that we see, the un, those that are unworthy of the ministry, standing in the place of ministry. Where am I going to find these examples? Where am I going to find someone that I can follow as they followed the Apostle Paul? Let me make it clear. In your local church. God is powerful enough and big enough, no matter what size your church is, there is somebody in that church that you can watch and follow. I can start naming those that were in my dad's church. I can start naming those as a kid that I watched growing up. And I saw there was a guy, uh, him and his wife, uh, his name was Mr. Wolf. She would tie her hair up in a bun, and when she went to shout, and she'd shake those bobby pins out, and she'd go to shout. It always cracked me up that, that Mr. Wolf. He had, uh, he had uh, palmate or something he'd put on his hair, and he had it slicked down. I mean, just as slick as you could go. When he got in his car, <laughs> when he got in his car, he'd put on one of the trucker's cap when the trucker's cap weren't cool. He'd put one right on top of his head. Now, he used to do that so it wouldn't mess up his hair when you had to ride without the air condition. Remember those cars? Had no air condition and the window was down? That's why he was wearing the trucker's cap was to keep his hair straight. But then when he got air conditioned and was able to ride down the road with the windows up, he would always put that trucker's cap on in the air condition with the windows rolled up. It just cracked me up as a kid. You ever notice things about people when you're a kid? He'd take that cap off and he'd set it on the dash when he got in the church parking lot and he'd get out. And I don't know how old they were, 80s, 90s. They were still coming to church. There are examples in your local church of people that God will send no matter what size your church is. The guy on television, you cannot follow the guy on television. Listen to me. Please listen to me. I know there's good preaching. I know there's good preaching on Facebook. But I'm telling you there's something about having a local pastor that you can sit down with. You can watch him as he deals with problems, as he deals with people. You can see his temperance. You know whether he's got a temper, whether he acts out of anger, whether he's got grace about him, whether he's got mercy about him. But in your local church, God will put women. If you're a woman that you can follow, there'll be leaders in your life. You can say, I want to be like her. I want to pray like her. I want to walk like her. I want to have a family like her. I want to raise my kids like her. God will put men in your life if you're a man and you can say, I want to be a husband like him. I want to be a father like him. I want to be a Christian like him. That's where those examples come from are in your local church. I thank God for the gospel that's now on Facebook. I thank God for the preaching, some of them that's on television. But you call them when you have a need and see if you get in touch with them. This is why you need a local church. This is why you need to see the leaders of our church. When, uh, <laughs> and we got projects coming up, so I'm a little bashful to say this. But whenever the preacher's getting up asking for work day, just see if he shows up. If he's got gloves on and a shovel in his hand. Amen. Yeah. There's something about watching a man's life outside the pulpit that'll cause you to have trust and respect for him while he's in the pulpit that you can't see on that computer and you cannot see on that television. Are you listening to me? And there's good preachers on that computer and there's good preachers on the television. But it's your local church where you'll see women walking with God. When their husbands pass away, you'll see them at the altar, in church, coming to Sunday school. When they're, when they're going through difficulties with their children, you'll see them at the altar, praying through those difficulties. When they're struggling, you need those examples. Paul said, follow those examples. If you want to be like Christ, follow the examples of those that you see striving like Christ. They're not perfect. I'm not perfect. Ain't none of us perfect. Paul wasn't perfect. But we're trying. Amen. 
Give yourself a little credit if you're trying. Some ain't trying. He said, follow the examples. But then he said, I want you to flee from the enemies. Don't be around them. Don't stay around them. In verses 18 and 19, he said, flee from the enemies. He said, for many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they're the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their in their who whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. This is what Paul is saying. And notice that he starts off and he says, For many, many, if I'm going to be like Christ, what this new what this new church, this American gospel that has gone through our nation tells you that Jesus is here to meet your needs. That is not why Jesus came. He's not here. He is not a divine detergent or divine psychiatrist to meet your needs. That is the satisfaction of man. You're not here to be satisfied. What you're here to do is satisfy him. And the way you satisfy him is in trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior, getting born again, and then living it in front of him. This world today, this spiritual leadership, this perversion of the gospel, this, this blurred Bible interpretation that we have in our nation today is that Jesus has come to meet your needs. You say, well, what about Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19? We'll get to that. He does meet our needs. But what I'm telling you is that's not the primary purpose of your salvation. It's for you to be satisfied. I don't come to church so God can do something for me. I come to church so I can do something for God. So I can sing for Him. So I can preach for Him. So I can encourage somebody for Him. It's about satisfying God. That's why He saved me. And I don't know if you know it. That's good preaching right there. (laughs) I am here. If I have biblical salvation then I have satisfied God and am satisfying God. Again, I'm not perfect, but I am trying. Every successful man or woman that you ever meet have become successful because they set goals in their lives. Every billionaire, every basketball player, every athlete, every individual that you come across that's successful at what they do, they've done it by setting goals and meeting those goals one right after the other. And I want to say this about every spiritual leader that has done great things for God, have done it by setting goals in their spiritual life, and sometimes at great cost, great sacrifice, and great suffering. You do understand that. That doesn't mean everything's going to go your way. If you do set those goals, the devil is going to fight. But many of those men, George Mueller, Lee Robertson, some of the ones that I can name tonight that you know very well, those great men that did great things for God did it because they set great goals, but they, they come along with suffering and sacrifice that they, be, they, that they may be Christ-like. So God has placed someone in your life to pattern your life after. I'm not just saying this because I'm behind the pulpit. I would say this if I wasn't in the pulpit. But your pastor, your preacher is is a pattern that God has put in your life. And I take it very seriously. And I am nervous and scared to death about the fact that I have a responsibility to be a pattern in front of you. Some of you have been with me in all kinds of circumstances. Some of you have been with me when I'm angry. Some of you have been with me when I'm frustrated. Some of you have been with me when, uh, when things weren't going so well. And I hope during those times when things were not well that I did demonstrate that I want to be like Christ in those times. Have I made mistakes? Yes. Will I make more? Yes. But I am trying. I had the greatest teacher. I watched Teague walk with Christ every day. He lived for Christ. I've told you so many stories, but I'll tell you this one again because it's one of the best ones I have. I had just kind of wrestled with my language and defeated it. And I had never heard Tig say a cuss word. And he was putting the cover on his bass boat, and he had one of those straps. He had hooked it to the other side, and he was pulling with all his might to hook it on the other side. So when we towed it down to the coast, Christians go to the coast. When we go down to the coast, he would pull us in an inner tube sometimes in the, internet, in the intercoastal waterway, and then we'd fish a little bit. 
And he was pulling that strap and it broke. And when that strap broke, it come across the boat and smacked him right square between the shoulders in his back. Now this is what I thought in my immature Christian mind. He'll cuss now. I just stood there and watched. I thought, there's one coming out. I know. I just know it because that's what I'd have done. I mean, I just conquered my language. I'm just being honest with you. He stood straight up. He said, man, that hurt. He just went and got another strap. And what I'm telling you is as a pastor, I take it very seriously that your kids have been fishing with me. Some of your kids have played golf with me. Some of your kids have seen me uh, outside of the church, outside of the realm of being the pastor. And I want to be an example of what Christ is like to others. And I want to say this to our deacons, our teachers, our singers. All of us should be a pattern. We're not perfect, but we are trying to be Christ-like. You should be an example. Your teacher, your Sunday school teacher, our deacons, all of us should take it seriously that there are, uh, there are others that are watching us and there are others that are, are viewing our lives so, as to whether we're reaching for the prize or not. And let me say the ones that are living in your house know best whether you're reaching. And they're the most important. Let me move on. There's some preaching there, but I won't. Verse 18. He said, for many walk of whom I have told you often, indicating that Paul had named these men to them personally. They knew who he was talking about. And he said, I tell you, even weeping. Paul cried many tears, but in this verse it indicates that he's now crying as he writes these words. Whether he's dictating these words at the time to Timothy or whether he is writing them with his own hand, he said, I right now am weeping. Why? Because Jesus even warned us that there will be men that come in sheep's clothing. They will walk in as if they're the best thing to Christianity. He said, but they're ravening wolves. And they want to take you away from the gospel. And they want to take you away from the things of Christ. You should be able to identify these men. You should be able to identify their ministries. You should be able to see them. The Holy Spirit should be able to show you that they are deceivers. And there have been many victims of these enemies. That's why Paul is weeping. Because he knows that there are some that have been victims of these ministries. These people, Paul said, of whom I'm, I've told you, I am sorrowful because I believe that these men, these enemies he's talking about are lost. They're going to die lost. He said the end is their destruction. Verse 19, whose end is destruction. He said they're going to hell. They're not real Christians. They're not real preachers. They're just, they're just men that know how to organize a ministry and know how to entertain a crowd. They said they're not real. And you should be, and it won't take you long to watch them. If you do watch them on television, if you do listen to them on the radio, it won't take you long to realize they are not of God. What they're saying is not of God, and they are not Christ-like. <laughs> Let me see if I can play it. say this as clear as I can without focusing on any one person. Jesus had nowhere to lay his head. As far as we know, when he died, the only thing he owned was the raiment, and it was stolen from him. There's something wrong with men that go into the ministry, and they're more attuned to accumulating what they can down here instead of what they can get on the other side. All you got to do is look it up on the Internet. They, you can find out how wealthy they are. And there are people, they're victim after victim after victim after victim. Jesus said they're wolves, rabbiting wolves. Paul said, I'm weeping because, uh, because they are destructive to the church. There are people that follow them. And I don't know whether they're saved or not because they're following a ministry of a wolf. Paul said, I'm sorrowful because they're ever present. Paul knew that he may not make it out of Rome and he didn't. And when they chopped his head off, he knew the wolves were still going to be there attacking the church that look like sheep, that say they're Christians. Paul said, follow the examples, but then I want you to flee from the enemy. Now, he could be talking about two different groups. And listen to me very carefully. He could be talking about the Jews, the Judaizers. Remember, we talked about them. Who said, it is the gospel plus the law. Now, we've got those today. 
I just found out, and, and because I'm on the internet, I'm, gonna, and I, I'm not going to name any denomination, but I just found out, surprised me, a man that came from this denomination got saved, and he's out of that denomination, that they tell them that you have to take communion every service. If you don't, you lose your salvation. I was surprised. I knew the, I knew the ones that told that, but this one surprised me. I, I couldn't believe that they told somebody that, and I, and I, and I asked him very plainly, I, a very logical question. Well, what about Monday when we don't have service? And I don't take the Lord's Supper. Did I lose my salvation? You can see the problem with this. What about, what about Wednesday? Or do we have to do it again Wednesday night? That's a work. We haven't done it because of COVID in a year, but we do the Lord's Supper, and it's part of what we do. But if you don't participate in the Lord's Supper, you don't lose your salvation. There's a lot of things I think you ought to do as a Christian, but if you don't do it, I'm not standing up here saying, I'm going to tell you, if you don't come to church Sunday, you're lost. I ain't telling you that. I can't take your salvation away. God's got a hold of you. He's either sealed you or he hasn't sealed you. What I'm telling you, there are Judaizers today. That's not the only thing. All you got to do is listen for a little, uh, a little carefully to those that are on the internet and radio. All you got to do is listen carefully. They'll start telling you the things you have to do to hold on to your salvation. Let me just tell you, you couldn't hold on to your salvation to begin with. You can't hang on to it after you're saved. When I ask Jesus to save me, God saved me. God has me. He has a hold of me. I can't lose it. He's stronger than I am. He said in John chapter 10, he said, God, my Father is greater than all. I don't know how you go to bed with that kind of salvation. You know what I would do? I would have a bottle of, of Welch grape juice and bread with me all the time. I'd have it in a, I'd have it in a little, uh, what do you call those things that you stick the straw in? And then they all have kids. What do you call it? Juice box. I have a juice box and bread with me in my pocket all the time, just making sure I won't lose my salvation. Juice. <laughs> Crazy. Judaizers. It's the same thing. We've got it in independent fundamental uh, Baptist. Tacking things onto your salvation. You've got to do this. Can't listen to that. Can't wear this. And I believe that there are some things you should not wear as a Christian. And I believe there's some things you shouldn't listen to. And I believe there's some things you shouldn't view. But it doesn't remove your salvation because you do. Don't take the gospel and add to it. Paul is saying the Judaizers did that. So he's either talking about the Judaizers or he's talking about the Gentiles. The Gnostics. The Gentiles were the Gnostics that came along and they said uh, that it's the gospel of Jesus Christ and your works really don't matter. In fact, the Gnostics are so bad, this is what they say. The Gnostics believe that everything that is, everything that is material is bad. This pulpit is material, it's bad. This pen, my phone, my body is material, it's bad, it's doomed, it's evil. So there's nothing you can do about it. Now, your soul, when you get saved, when you trust Christ and the gospel, your soul is saved, so it doesn't matter what you do with your body. You can be a homosexual. You can be a pervert. You can commit incest. It really don't matter. Your soul is saved, so it doesn't matter what you do with your body. That's what the Gnostics say, because it's material. Material's bad. Spiritual is good. But they're the ones that also teach that Jesus wasn't God. They teach that Jesus didn't physically resurrect from the dead because that's material. So when we get to heaven, it's a spiritual world. It's a, it's a euphoria. It not is, it's not a real place. That's not what your Bible says. These men are the enemy of the gospel. And they're still out there today. It's not just in Paul's day. They're still preaching and teaching that today. They're the ones that are saying materialistically, material spirit is neither male or female. That's why you don't know whether you're really male or female. That's where that transgender junk come from. Listen to me. Paul said it's not the gospel plus anything, and it's not the gospel minus your works. It's the gospel period. That's it. That's it. So they, they say you can you can take your body and you can be a glutton. You can be a gambler. You can be an alcoholic. It doesn't matter. All that's going to be destroyed anyway. This is what Paul said about those enemies. He said their end is, is, is destruction. They're going to hell. For teaching falsely the things of God, they're pure. Their God is their belly. You can see it in their lifestyles. All they want are the materialistic things of this world. And then lastly, he says this about him. He said, whose glory is in their shame. What does that mean? He said, they ought to be ashamed, but they glory in it. 
They ought to be ashamed of what they're saying, but they glory in it. They ought to be ashamed that they're telling poor people that God doesn't intend on them being poor, but they glory in it. And they brag on their wealth, saying God will do the same thing for you, and ought to be ashamed of saying that. They can preach it in America. They can't go preach it in these poor countries where people can't get out of their poverty. And they can't help the poverty that they're in. And what I'm saying is Paul's saying they're glorying in it. They ought to be ashamed of what they're doing. In fact, one day they will be when they find themselves destroyed in hell because they've preached it and they've taught it. Paul said, follow the examples that are before you and then flee from the enemy. And then he ends up in the last two verses. He said, make sure that you focus on the expectations to come. This is my favorite part of chapter 3. Because it takes all of this junk, the false teaching, the false preaching, and it puts our focus right back where it ought to be. And that is, you cannot stay here. One day you're going to stand before Christ, and you're going to give an account of what you've done. And you better make sure that you're doing it right now, because when you get before Christ, there'll be no excuses. He knows not only what you've done, but he knows the intent behind what you've done. The focused expectations, verse 20. But our conversation is in heaven. From whence we also look for the Savior, for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body and shall make it, and it shall be fashioned like unto his glorious body. This is Paul poking fun and kind of sarcastically going after the Gnostics. He said, We're getting another body, and it's a physical body, materialistic body. It's made of material. We're going to a place that is literal. There are real streets of gold that you can touch, there are real walls of jasper. There are 12 gates, and this is what amazes me. I don't know what you've imagined about those gates, but I believe the gates are made of one large pearl, all 12 gates, one huge pearl. That's my imagination. That's just what I think. I can't prove that in the Bible. That's just what I think. One day, you're going to be able to touch it. You're going to be able to stand there. You're going to see it. Paul is telling the Gnostics, we have a vile body. It is evil, but we're getting rid of this vile body, and God's going to give us instead a glorious body according to the work whereby he is able to subdue all things under to him. Boy, it excites me. And I, and I think Paul was getting excited about what he was writing there. It's Paul's mind is halfway in the other world and halfway in this world. We live in a Christian age where it's all about comfort instead of accomplishment. It's all about us being comfortable down here. Paul literally lived many times in depravity. He had little creature comforts while he was in the ministry. And you find him often weeping. Paul was one of the greatest Christians in this New Testament. You see it in Peter's life who was imprisoned and eventually crucified. You see it in John's life, James' life who was beheaded. That teaching of prosperity and wealth is a lie. And it's not in your Bible. But this is what we do. We live to be Christ-like knowing that one day we will be with Him in glory. Why does it matter? Why does all this matter? It matters very little what happens here. But it matters greatly what happens over there. Because what happens here, whatever it is, is temporal. If you struggle with sin and there's some sin that creeps up over and over and over again, one day that's going to end. And you're going to be in eternity. If you're here and you're trying to live for Christ and you struggle with it and you fall down and get up and fall down and stumble, that's okay because it's going to end. That temporal is going to end one day and you're going to be in a land that's eternal. So do your best. Live for Christ. Be right. Be Christ-like knowing that one day you're going to a place that's, that's eternal and the struggles you're having down here will one day end. What matters, what matters here matters very little. What, what matters there matters greatly. Let me just ask you a, a clear and plain question. How many of you, don't raise your hand, don't answer out loud. How many of you want to go to heaven? Don't answer. What if I told you you could go right now? Would you go? Just think about it for a second. Shouldn't our Christian heart say, yes, I want out of here. I don't want to leave my family. I don't want to leave my daughters behind. I don't want to leave my son-in-laws behind. I don't want to leave my in-laws behind. I don't, want to, I don't want to leave people behind, but I do want to go to heaven. Are you listening to me? 
As far as I know, they're saved and they're going to come join me one day. But if you're taking up a load next, I wouldn't mind going. I wouldn't mind getting out of here. We have become, as, especially American Christians, so comfortable in this world that we want to stay here. Paul is saying that death for a Christian becomes a friend. Death is not an enemy to us. Death is a friend. It's a release from going from here to there. How could I go through the death of my mentor and my father-in-law, T. Gross? Because he taught me that. He taught me that there's another world to go to. There's another world to live for. There's another world to lay up treasures in. How could I go through the death of mom and dad within two weeks? Because mom and dad told me they're not staying here. They're going somewhere else. And they wanted me to follow them there. So tonight, what I'm telling you, do you want to go to heaven? You ought to have a heart ready to go all the time. There should be nothing down here that's got your heart so much that you wouldn't want to let go of it. What about my family? Tell your family about Jesus. Tell them where you're going. And if you leave today, Sal, see you on the other side. Hallelujah. Amen. If that ain't Bible, I don't know what is. Listen to this. This phrase, our conversation, means a foreign colony. Our country started this way. There were a group of people that were in England that wanted to worship freely. So they got on a boat and they sailed to a land and they became a colony. What were their names? Pilgrims. That's what we are. This is not home. We're just pilgrims passing through. I shouldn't get a hold of this world so much that I don't want to leave it. Pilgrims passing through. That's the word that Paul is using for us. That our conversation is in heaven. Our lifestyle, our manner of life, our citizenship, our identity is in heaven. We're not waiting on an event. We're waiting on a person. I know the next event is the rapture, but I'm not waiting on an event. I'm looking for a person. I'm looking for Jesus. This is why I believe so many of our so-called spiritual leaders have gone to post-tribulation instead of pre-trib. They so much love this present world, they don't want to leave it. When the rapture takes place, they don't want to leave this world. They want to stick around. They want to see who the Antichrist is. They want to, they want to get... <laughs> it's bad when your flesh wants to say something and the Holy Spirit says no but it's good to obey the Holy Spirit this is why so many of them are now post-trib because they've fallen so in love with this world they want to be here they're just nosy and want to see what goes on in the tribulation I don't care I'm going to be with Jesus I'm glad that John wrote it down but I don't necessarily want to see it I'm going to be with Jesus One day we're going home to be with him. And there are things that this accountability does. There are things that this type of focus does. If you stay focused on heaven to a place the world has no hold on your heart, it changes you and you begin to live Christ-like. Why? You don't know when you may be standing before him. It may be in the next 10 seconds, 5 seconds. So that's why you must live like Christ. We are going to a trial by fire. At the Bema seat. And then we're going to our eternal reward. The Bible says we'll stand before Christ with the works that we've done in this body. This is why I don't have time to criticize any preachers on Facebook and social media. I have enough that I'm accountable for. That it terrifies me that I'm going to have to stand before Christ. Not with my sins. My sins are gone. But the things that I've done in this body. Have I held any grudges? Have I done things that I've not apologized for? The Bible says in Revelation, and there's a lot of Christians, there's a lot of church members that I know. In the book of Revelation, if you read it, you read it correctly, that God will reveal the secrets. Whatever you've not made right down here, you will have to make right there at the judgment seat. You will have to apologize to church members that you've talked about. You will have to apologize to pastors that you have wronged. You will have to apologize for those things that you've done down here. They're not sins. Your sins are gone. You can't stand before God with your sins. They're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. There are works, and Paul said there are good works and there are bad works, and you're going to have to give an account for those bad works. Unless you do as Paul says and examine yourself and make things right down here, and judge yourself before you get up there before the ultimate judge I do have I hope 
and I'm working for the fact that I want to have some rewards when he's done. There's going to be some wood, hay, and stubble burn up in my life, but I do want to have some gold and silver and precious stones left behind for my reward. Our dads taught us that, Paul. We saw that demonstrated in their life. There's a world to live for. On this. Why did Stan Bunky go to that nursing home and preach to, those, to that group home kids? Nobody, I didn't know he was doing that. Why did he do that? Because he knew there was another world to come. That he, his name wouldn't be on a placard. And it may, not be, it may not make Facebook that he's doing that. But why was he doing that? There's another world to come. There's a Jesus to stand in front of. There's rewards on the other side. And these are retir- eternal rewards. I like stuff down here. i got to be honest. I like nice houses. I, I like nice cars. I like guns. Y'all know that. I like buying guns, trading guns. I have a very good friend. His commandment, his, t- his 11th commandment. This is not Bible, by the way. His 11th commandment is, Thou shalt not sell any of thy guns. That's his 11th commandment. But sometimes I like to trade them and see if I can make a little off of them. I like guns. I like fishing. I like all those things. But all those things are temporal. And whatever rewards you get for working your job down here, all of it's going to be left behind. I just watched my dad leave it all behind. I watched my mom leave it all. The house, the cars, is all here. It's left here. The jewelry, all of it, left here. There are some things and rewards that they've got on the other side. That's what I want. I want the eternal ones. I want the ones on the other side that are going to be greater than the cars and the houses and the guns or whatever you like to buy down, shoes or dresses or whatever it is you like. It's going to be greater on the other side because those things on the other side are eternal rewards given to you by Christ Jesus himself. Why does this focus? Why is this focus? He says, follow the examples, flee from the enemies, and he said, make sure that you're focused on the right expectations. Why is this important? Number one, it motivates me. We've got outreach this coming Saturday. You think I like getting up early on a Saturday morning and coming and going on visitation? I do. I do like it, but not all the time. Sometimes I'm tired on Saturday morning. I work just like y'all do. I have a yard. Nobody mows my yard. I have to mow my yard. With a wife that's uh, crippled, I have to clean the house. I have to do things around the house. So on Saturday morning when the alarm goes off, the one thing I'm thinking about, it's warming up Saturday, so I'm thinking about going bass fishing. We have outreach Saturday. So you know why I'm coming? Because it motivates me to do what I can do down here when I can while I have time. Whatever bass I'm not going to catch, whatever activity or rest I'm not going to get, I promise you it's going to be worth it in eternal glory. It motivates me. Why? When my focus is on heaven, it motivates me to do the right things. It motivates me to stay right before God. Number two, it holds me accountable. It reminds me that I'm going to be held accountable for every, every idle word. I'm going to be accountable for studying the Bible, praying, being the right husband, being the right father. I'm going to be held accountable. So the right focus leads me in the right expectations. Lastly, it gives me great security. To know that Jesus said in John chapter uh, 17, all that God has given me, I've lost none. Amen. Now, I know where you are, Christian. You may be in the hog pen, but I know where you are. You may be in the Lord's house, and I know where you are. You may be backslidden in the Lord's house, but I know where you are. You may be right with God in the Lord's house, but I know where you are. When he got on the Mount of Transfiguration, he called Elijah and Moses up with him on the Mount of Transfiguration. You know why? Because he had them. He knew where they were. He hadn't lost them. And when you get saved, you have eternal security of what Paul is saying here. He said, our conversation is heaven. Paul said, it's just as good as if you're already there. I wish we could have seen what Paul saw because Paul said, it is far better over there. I have seen it and I just want you to know. I've seen what you've got down here. And Paul saw what Nero had and Felix and Agrippa. He saw what the politicians had. And he saw wealthy, the wealthy Jews that were down here. He saw them inside the church, the ones that had money. I said, I see what you've got. He said, I just want to tell you... When it comes to the things that are down here, he said, it's far better over there. There's nothing you got down here you want to hold on to. When you get to that city of gold, there's nothing you want to hold on to down here. When you get in the presence of God, there's nothing you want. The glory, he said, that the, the glory that is to come, we cannot even compare the affliction, the light affliction of this world to the glory that is to come. If I can't convince you of that, let Paul convince you of that. Heaven is better. Live like Christ. 
to motivate you to give you accountability and the eternal security of knowing that there's nothing I can do to change my eternal destiny. I cannot lose my salvation. I am His, born into His family. And I cannot be unborn. Let me tell you a story as I close. It's just ironic, this man's name is Focus. P-H-O-C-A-S, Focus of the 4th century. He was a Christian. You realize the 4th century, there was, there was uh, Jesus who was in the 1st century, and then there was John who made it almost to the 2nd century. And then under John, there was Polycarp. You may know that name. Polycarp got saved under the ministry of John the Apostle. So Focus didn't come far along behind these men. Focus was a Christian in his little town, and he made a little garden there beside of his cottage on the road. And in this garden, he had a little gate, and, and he would invite people that were walking on the road. He said, I know you've had a, large, a long journey. Why don't you come in? I've got water. I've got food. I've got a place you can sit under my shade tree. And in his little garden, men and women would come in, and he would talk to them about the Lord while they were there. How could you reject the kindness of that little friendly guy? merciful guy named Focus so one day he was there at his garden tending his garden and thinking I don't think of a better place that I love more on this earth than this garden three men came walking up they were Roman soldiers and he said man I know you've had a long journey I know you've got a long journey ahead of you come in and let me refresh you with some water I've got snacks. I could feed you if you want. So as they sat in his garden, he told them about Jesus. And he said, now tell me, it's late in the day. What is, your, what is your business? Why are you heading to the city? And they said, we've been given a command to kill a man, a Christian in this area, named Focus. And he said, if you know of this man, would you please let us know? It pierced Focus' heart as he knew the orders that had been given to these men so he said we'll talk about this tomorrow let's rest tonight and in the morning we'll... he said I know focus I know who he is we'll talk about it in the morning that night the men rested completely in focus's little cottage but that night focus stayed up all night praying and he said you know Jesus didn't avoid the garden Jesus didn't avoid the cross He said, I cannot avoid my fate. If these men don't carry out their orders, they're going to die lost without Christ. And they have a greater doom and fate in hell than I do in heaven. So in the morning, the men got up, well rested. And he had dug a grave in that little garden. And he was standing in the grave. The men came out and they said, what are you doing, Focus? He said, well, they come out and they said, what are you doing? He said, my name is Focus. And he said, I know your job. And he said, you have to take my life. He said, but it's okay. The Jesus I told you about will take me to heaven when you kill me. That's the focus that we need to have. Not the man, the focus on the expectation. He said, I can't escape this, and I'm not going to escape it. I'm going to allow you to perform your duty. The men with tear-filled eyes thought it very hard to kill a man that had so much mercy on him. But they did. They buried him in that garden. Focus went to be with the Lord. How many Christians would have tried to leave that night? How many American Christians would have never told him who he was? As soon as they went on their way to the town to find him, find an animal and ride off and try to escape. Listen to me. Heaven is better. Paul said, if you're going to be like Christ, follow the examples. Flee the enemy and focus on the expectations of what is to come because it is far better. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Matt's going to come and sing us a song of invitation. Maybe God has spoken to your heart. Paul said, I press toward the mark, the prize. This is the prize. What's the prize? I want to be Christ-like. That's what I want to be. As a husband, as a father, as a church member, me as a pastor, As a preacher, I want to be Christ-like. In the church, behind the pulpit, on the golf course with a fishing rod, driving down the road, I want to be Christ-like. I'm not telling you it's easy. 
I'm just telling you, it, it can be done. Paul said, I want to be this. Would you stand to your feet with your heads bowed and your eyes closed if you need to come? Just find a place around this altar. Maybe there's something God's pointed out in your life that's not Christ-like. And you want to come and say, God, help me to get rid of this. Maybe there's something you need in your life that is Christ-like. And you want to come and say, God, let me attain that, as Paul said in verse 16. Let me attain that, that I may know what it's like to be a soul winner, a visitation partner, somebody that reads the Bible every day, prays every day. There may be something you're struggling with. Come on right now. Find a place around this altar. Do your very best oh, to ask Him to help you walk like Christ. No, there's no greater joy for the Christians. I pray. There's no greater satisfaction. There's no greater fulfillment. See if there I hope you see that in your leaders, but if you don't, you should see that in the Apostle Paul's life. Way you should see that in the life of Peter, John, and James. Testament, Philip, Stephen. As they were stoning Stephen, from he looked to heaven and asked God to forgive them. Why? He'd get ready to go. He'd get ready to leave this world. Focus on the expectations of what's to come. One more verse. One Lord, more verse. Will this be Lord, take my life. My life yes. And make it whole. now in our auditorium we've just started our personal invitation for this service and I wanted to come on and give you an opportunity if this message and these songs have reached your heart in a special way and today you want to trust Christ as your Savior I want to give you an opportunity to do that it's very simple if you'll just take a moment here with me and pray and ask the Lord to save you he's promised to do that he said whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved you start with acknowledging your sin and realizing that that sin has to be forgiven. He's the only one that can forgive it. So we're going to ask Him to forgive you of your sins. And then we're going to ask Him to save you. And He said, He that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. It doesn't matter about your education. It doesn't matter about your past. It doesn't matter about your position in life. He'll, he'll save anybody. So if you're serious, pray this prayer with me. Dear God, please forgive me of my sins. I repent of them. I am sorry for them. Right now, become the Lord of my life. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that He died and rose again. And now I want You to save me and take me to heaven when I die. In Jesus' name. If you just prayed that prayer, take a moment, call our church office at 336-320-2090 or comment wherever you're watching the service. You don't have to give us your name, but we'd love to make a note of you getting saved. And if you got saved and you're not in the area of Temple Baptist Church, you find a good Bible-believing church. You're saved now. You're going to heaven. But in between now and heaven, you're going to have doubts and questions you need a preacher that can answer those questions. You need a church where you can fellowship with Christians. Thanks so much for listening today. We'll see you on our...